Hey, what's up? This is your girl, Lady Dee Dee Wilson, and I'm trying to tell you this is episode what? Five of Skid Row Talks coming at you live from downtown Los Angeles. Skid Row, known as the Nickel. Okay, last segment we had Alonzo Williams. We had the pleasure of having him. Um, we look forward to seeing him again. But now we have, I have a, a long awaited friend. We have, I have, in the office today. Let's see. Oh my goodness. 20 year of officer law enforcement, 18 years of being on the road, skid road. Right. Man, he is senior lead officer of the Central Division and he's better known as the Thunder. Right. <laughs> the Thunder. And when I say, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't know, now you know, the lady got him personally in the office. I got him to myself. What a mission for the work. And I told him, before we go in the train, I'm going to get my bean pie. You're going to get a bean pie. No, I, sure. Your bean pie, not a bean pie. No, no. Okay. No, no. Homemade, <laughs> everything brown. Brown sugar, brown flour. We're going to make it happen. Right. Man, it's such an honor to have you, Officer Joseph, here in this office today. Thank you. Thank you. Such a welcoming, such a welcoming. Oh my goodness. Um, very humble man, related to the people. Wasn't in the office for five minutes. The lady ran in here and said, Officer Joseph. And you just said, ah, How can I help you? Whatever she did, that's what I'm here for. That's These right. are my people. Yes, 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 yes. And I mean, it's like, it's just it's just an amazing thing, sir. And I want to continue to commend you. But I want to get to the topics because I know your time is very valuable. Yeah. So I just want to ask you, we came, we just collaborated with three major topics that you probably hear all the time. But in this office, you know, everything is calm and we're allowed to say anything and it's sincere and honest. The uncut and raw. That's what Lady Dee Dee Wilson's about. I wouldn't have no other word. So let's talk about the mental illness. Here in the world. Can you give us some pointers on where do you see that going and where it's at now and where do you see it going? Mental illness has always been one of the biggest challenges that we've always had here in Central Division. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, in my mind, it's a moral crime that America's solution to helping or quote unquote helping the mental Ill, mentally ill has been to close down the asylums, mm -hmm. kick them out into the street, and then uh, other groups kind of basically sue to keep from building other ones that can help them. So now, America's current solution has been uh, to sprinkle pills on them in the name of civil liberties mm -hmm. and then kick them out into the street to say, yeah, you're free. Right. Now for some, they have help, they have family, they have people that they can go to. But for a, a, an unfortunately, a good number of them, uh, they have no one. So they end up being either dumped or pushed into Skid Row mm -hmm. or wandering into Skid Row because they have services here, mm -hmm. uh, like food and clothes and things that they need. The problem with that is, when they run out of their prescribed pills, hmm. unlike you or I, you know, if you had a heart attack or you had a heart problem, and let's say you wanted to, uh, you ran out of your pills, what would you do? Well, if I ran out of my pills, I would go to my doctor and get some more. Get a refill. Right. Absolutely. Unfortunately, some of these individuals suffer from such extreme conditions that they don't have the wherewithal to do that. So when they run out of their pills, they end up self-medicating on crack cocaine, methamphetamines, and spice. And who's down here medicate them, mm -hmm. medicating them? The gang members, okay? Mm -hmm. They don't care about their condition. They just care about keeping them high and making money off of their back and then leaving town. Mm -hmm. Now, that in my mind is wrong because I've always said, and so are my fellow officers, we said mental illness is not a crime. It never has been a crime. Mm -hmm. It's not a crime to be bipolar. It's not a crime to be paranoid schizophrenic. It's not a crime to be any of those things. But when somebody who's dysfunctional, disenfranchised, and extremely bipolar, extremely mentally ill, become introduced to meth, crack, and spice, now they become a police problem because that addiction, that dual diagnosis, drives them to do horrific things, not only to themselves, mm -hmm. but also to other people in the community, like violent crimes. Right. I've been on many uh, crime investigations where I saw a mentally ill person stab somebody, mm -hmm. hurt somebody. We had an art walk. We had a uh, mentally ill woman who we knew needed help mm -hmm. a long time ago, but she grabbed a baby from a stroller and slammed it against the wall. Mm -hmm. And in all those circumstances, I never said it was the mentally ill person's fault. Mm -hmm. Society failed them because they forced us as law enforcement, fire department, and mental health services to be after the fact entities. And let me explain how that is. The only way that a police department 
uh, can quote unquote help the mentally ill is through a three prong approach through a 5150 hold. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they have to qualify under three prongs. The first is a danger to yourself. Mm -hmm. And that means you said the magic words, I'm gonna kill yourself, I wanna kill myself, right. or you're demonstrating that right. by jumping in front of city buses. Mm -hmm. And then we get to quote unquote help you. Now understand there's a common theme behind all three of these uh, scenarios. Then somebody who's a danger to others, someone who goes out there and actively hurts somebody through mm -hmm. no fault of their own, they're mentally ill, mm -hmm. and now they're high, and now they're hurting, they're stabbing. Uh, then we get to, if we get there and they haven't killed anybody, we can hook them up and take them mm -hmm. on a second trial hold. Uh, uh, and sometimes it's too late where they commit a crime, mm -hmm. and now we unfortunately have to send them to through the justice system, mm -hmm. which in my opinion, I'm telling you, I'm a police officer. Right. I arrested friends of mine who were mentally ill, yeah. who I said, I know from a public safety and a liability standpoint, it had to happen. But morally, it's wrong for handcuffs to be a solution. And yeah, those people are getting mental help in a prison, but when they get out, they're gonna, they're gonna fall back into the same traps. Right. Now, and then the last problem we can help somebody is if they're grave disabled. That means they're either so mentally ill or so physically ill to the point to where then, and only then, we can force them to go get help, get mm -hmm. hospitalized or on a second trial hold. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a common theme with all three of those those scenarios. All three of those are prompts. And it's, we have to wait until it's too late. Yeah. And that's wrong. So unfortunately, society puts it on our back and says, well, you know, why aren't you guys doing anything? Mm -hmm. They only gave us handcuffs. Right. And then unfortunately, when we end up getting into uses of force and things like that, it's not because of a lack of training or compassion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Years ago, when it was mostly just mental illness, I could see a guy who I knew. Hey, Rob. Hey, put your clothes on. Come off the building. Right, and he looked right. at me and go because he knew me. Right. Oh, yeah, Joseph. He knew you. Yeah. Oh, Joseph, you all come down. Mm -hmm. And he 